and I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Tom Cheeseright. Tom is an applied futurist, the first applied futurist in the UK. He is a exceptionally talented and thought-provoking character. Uh, we've had the uh, the pleasure of his company at a couple of downtown conferences in the past. The feedback that we get from Tom's presentations is always fabulous. He's going to share some of his thoughts in a moment or two but first of all welcome Tom. Thank you, thank you very much Frank. It's great to see you and uh, let me just talk about this fabulous role that you've uh, eked out for yourself as an applied futurist uh, because it's clearly a role that you've undertaken for a number of years now but as I said in my opening remarks there you were the first in the UK. What made you wake up one day Tom and say I'm going to be an applied futurist. <laughs> <laughs> There's two answers to that. You know, one of them starts four, about 40 years ago. And I've actually got it here, actually. My, uh, my mum bought me, this is, it's, it's a rather tattered copy now, the Usborne Book of the Future. Uh, and I've been obsessed with the future ever since. Um, it's always been a passion of mine. Um, and I started writing about the future under the name Book of the Future, actually, back in about 2006. Uh, and then I ended up doing some stuff for the BBC, as you know, and, and commenting on tech and tomorrow. And then about eight years ago now, I was, I was running a tech startup with my friend Tim, uh, utterly burnt out. Uh, we'd raised our venture capital. I was working 75 hours a week, no relationship with my kids. And, you know, it was time to do something different. Mm. So all of a sudden, the hobby became a business. And uh, I went out there and, you know, sat down with a friend of mine who's a great branding guy and said, Look, here's what I'm doing. I'm writing about the future. I'm doing some broadcasting, I'm doing some speaking, I'm doing some consulting. What am I? And he said, you're an applied futurist after we'd had about five beers. And um, it took me about two years to work out what it really meant. But, you know, eight years on, uh, I worked with about 25 of the Global 500 uh, with governments. And, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful job. And more importantly, I get to spend some time with my kids, which I wasn't doing before. Yeah. And I think we're all in that boat at the moment wondering how we're going to be able to maintain I mean some of us are ready to kill one or more of the brood but, but nonetheless it is it has been nice to, to see more of the family and uh, and get to know them a little bit better I have to say and um, before we get into the presentation that you're going to share with us uh, in a moment Tom the other thing I, I want to to say at this juncture I suppose is that you work with those companies those 25 companies because what you do is apply very practical business advice to those businesses. So this isn't pie in the sky sort of fluffy stuff and you, think, <laughs> you know, where we, we all sit down and go and meditate for an hour and think, oh, wouldn't that be nice? This isn't, you know, flying saucers and all that sort of stuff. This is genuine. This can help your business. These are the sort of things that you should be thinking about when you're looking at your strategies for the future. Oh, yeah. You know, when people think of futurism, futurology, whatever you want to call it, and it historically it always has been about, you know, what might happen in 25 years? You know, when do I get my jet pack? Uh, you know, um, are we all going to stick chip microchips in our heads? All of this stuff. And that's just fun. And I get involved in that because it's exciting. But it's not the questions that my clients ask. Mm. You know, clients ring me up and they say, what's going to take me out at the knees in the next five years? Mm. What, how do I avoid being the next Kodak or the next Blockbuster? Yeah. You know, how can you help me see what's coming, be more agile, be more responsive? And, and that's really what this book is about. You know, my first book was about was, was me trying to understand why massive global companies are ringing up this bloke in Manchester and saying, help. And the second book is about the collected advice of the last eight years distilled into 40,000 words. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, just tell us a little bit about this book, because um, I know it was supposed to be launched a, a little bit later <laughs> in the summer. But, you, you know, like all of us, you're seeing challenges, but also opportunities at the moment. So people can actually download the book now, can't they? Yeah. Absolutely. So it's available on Kindle now. Get, obviously, getting it through the printers is rather more of a challenge, but the electronic version is out now. Uh, and it was, it was a funny story. So I, I um, hooked up with Penguin um, about August last year, and we agreed that I was going to write this book as part of their Penguin Business Experts series. And, and we originally intended to launch it in July, 30th of July, and that's still when the print version comes out. But about two weeks ago, Penguin rang me up and said, 
look, we're thinking of bringing forward the launch of the electronic version because it's so relevant to the current crisis. Um, what do you think? And I said, yeah, sounds great. You know, when, when are you going to do it? And they said, Tuesday. And this was a Thursday. I was like, right, <laughs> let's get planning. How are we going to launch a book in lockdown with about a week's notice? Um, so we have, you know, we've got, we've spoken, you were doing some live streams. We're doing some great, there's been some great PR over the last week. But yeah, you know, the, 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 the reason behind that, and I'll come on to talk about, you know, it is, I think, really relevant to the current situation, mm -hmm. both in terms of, you know, lots of organizations struggling right now. And, you know, maybe thinking sadly about not how do we survive, but how do we reinvent? Mm. But also lots of people who are going to survive now at home, got the time to think, to read, to step back a little bit. Something that's so difficult to do when you're caught up in the day to day of running a business. Maybe now is the time to step back and think a little bit differently. Mm. Fabulous. Well, listen, I'm going to have uh, an enjoyable 10, 15 minutes now and just let you <laughs> do all the work and, and listen to some of the fabulous messages that you've got, Tom. So over to you. Brilliant. Cheers, Frank. So I'm just going to throw up a few slides. And, you know, this isn't meant to be death by PowerPoint, but I find when you're doing these live streams, sometimes it's easy to have something visual to latch on to. And, and what, I want to talk about four things, because this is a very practical book. Like I say, the last book was really about theory. The last book was about why are people calling me? Why do we have this sense of acceleration and feel like we've been destabilized by the world spinning faster around us? But the second book is really a practical book, but it's underpinned by a really important philosophy. And I, and I think a change in philosophy that we all require. Um, I couldn't resist putting a bit of Joe Wicks in. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I've been doing the, uh, the Joe PE with Joe every morning with my kids. So I've rediscovered muscles. I didn't know I had them still about since about 20 years ago. But you know, this whole Lean in 15 thing is kind of relevant because we've spent so much of our time and so much of business theory is about being lean. It's about efficiency. How do we do better tomorrow what we did yesterday? And by better, I mean so often, how do we grow more, make more money, make more profit, grow revenue? But fundamentally based on the business we're already in. And I have a problem with that philosophy. I have a problem with that approach because as I discussed in my last book, we're going through a period of incredible disruption now, really two types of disruption. There's the mass scale global disruption we're all experiencing now as a result of this pandemic. But even if you're not going through that, we're seeing these very rapid waves of change pulse through individual industries being utterly disruptive as they go. And I work with a lot of organizations who are experiencing that right now, whether they're in the automotive industry, whether in the banking industry, where they've looked very, very you know, much the same for a long time. They've made their success by doing the same thing over and over and over again. And now all of a sudden, like actually that approach isn't going to work anymore. And they're starting to recognize that they have to do something different. And so from 40, 50 years, 100 years in some cases of being of optimizing, of continuous process optimization, of eking out more profit, squeezing cost, polishing what they do, getting better and better at their discipline, they're suddenly thinking, actually, I've got to learn to innovate. I've got to learn to adapt. I've got to be much more responsive. I need to build my organization to be resilient so that when these big shocks come along, whether they're the, the big shocks to an individual industry or company, as we've seen happening you know, with digital media, the music industry, and as I say, it's happening now with banking and automotive, or whether they're the global shocks like this pandemic, we've got to structure our organization to be resilient. And that's more of a priority than trying to squeeze the maximum of growth and profit out all the time. And so that shift from optimization to adaptation is the fundamental philosophical message of the book, if you like. After that, it's all practical, that, but that's the philosophy. And I think that's a really important point. And so when you do that, when you shift your horizon, you don't say, you know, I'm going to be, I'm in this to make the maximum growth the next 12 months, 18 months, two years. But actually, I'm trying to build a legacy. I'm trying to build sustainable success, an organization that's going to be here in five years, 10 years, and still have a happy and satisfied customer base still have great partners in my supply chain and maintain, you know, happy stakeholders, shareholders, then you've got to make some changes practically to how you run the business. And I try, I encapsulate those in this idea of an athletic business. I'm not an athlete as my performance uh, with Joe Wicks every morning shows, but when you look at great athletes, you learn things about them. And uh, uh, this partly comes from a great chat. I have Chris Akabusi about this, but there's, there's, there's three things you see great athletes have great athletes do. And one of them is this, they have much better senses than you or I. 
and two types of senses particularly. Firstly, that sort of proprioception, that sense of the runner on their shoulder or where that winger is, you know, running down the left-hand side channel and just placing the pass on that boot with barely looking up, that, that ability to read the game. That's really important in business and it's a critical business leadership skill now. The second thing that great athletes do is they take decisions really quickly. They pull in that information, whether it's about the strategy or about the immediate environment, and they make decisions like that, just a snap of the fingers and they know what they're gonna do. And the third thing they do is they train for the sport they're in. Now sports change over time, just like business changes over time. If you put a, a brilliant 1970s first division player into the premiership today, they'd get absolutely skinned because the standards have changed, the game has changed, and the same is true in business. You know, we, we're still playing sort of first division football in business day in, day out. And we've got to upgrade to the Premier League because the world's changed. We live in this low friction environment now where innovation moves much faster, where we're up against global competition rather than just local competition day in, day out. And just purely by the, the possibilities of digital communication and the friction being taken out of innovation, we can just do a lot more and we should be doing a lot more. And we've got to structure our businesses in such a way that allows us to do that. So I'll go into those three just briefly in a little more detail. The first one is about improving your senses as an organisation. And I try and teach this the same tool to every organisation I work with. And as I said, you know, based on Frank's questions at the start, you know, my work mostly isn't the sort of pie in the sky stuff. It's really, you know, sometimes I do get to go and dream about what might happen in 25, 30 years, but mostly clients are worried about what's going to hurt them or create opportunities in the next five years. And when I came into being a full-time futurist, I realized there were no obvious tools for doing that. No sort of processes you could use to say what's on the near horizon, not what's on the far horizon. And so I built one. And what I realized working with clients quite early on in this process was, all the changes they were experiencing usually came at existing fault lines, existing cracks or pressure points in their business or industry that were already visible, they just perhaps weren't aware of. So the first thing I get clients to do is go into their organization, go into their industry, go and talk to their customers, their peers, their partners, industry experts, analysts, their industry associations, and go, what are the pressure points? Go and talk to your staff, particularly on the shop floor. What are the pressure points we're facing? What causes us problems today? What don't you like about us, Mr. Customer? Um, you know, what is making you less productive, you know, person on the shop floor? Go and build a list of all those pressure points and then go and look at the big macro trends coming in from the side. And I talk about five in the book, but really you can go and pick up a copy of the FT, go and pick up a copy of Wired magazine, go and watch some TED Talks, go and do something to do some research and try and get a feel for the big trends that are affecting every industry that comes in. And what you find is where those pressure points you found intersect with those uh, macro trends that you see touching everything, that's where the change is going to affect your business. You kind of don't care about everything else. That's where it's going to affect your business. And what you do is you find five of those intersections, you put them on your to-do list for the next six months, and then you repeat the process in the six months' time. And I reckon that takes 1% of your time, one day every six months, to do that foresight process. And I think it's, it's not just a nice to have now, it's absolutely business critical, making the time to do that and doing it iteratively, consecutively every six months. The second thing I talked to you about is about accelerating decisions. How do we get that sort of athletic decision making? And there's two ways you can do this. One is you can upgrade your infrastructure and your processes. You can go through your, your business forensically and looking at where information gets stuck, where there's too many committees, too long meetings. You can invest in great software to move information faster, give you pretty analytics. And all that stuff's really valuable. But there's something you can do that is, I won't say too much easier because it requires a lot of effort and investment. But the certainly most effective thing you can do to accelerate decision making in your business is push power to the edge of the organization. It's let go if you're at the center and let people at the edge of the organization uh, take decisions. And I often tell a really good story about a company that does this, which is Lidl. Part of the reason Lidl and Aldi have grown so much the last five years is Lidl, by the way, my wife's half German. Um, Lidl and Aldi have grown so much the last few years is because they trust people at the edges of their organization. And about five years ago, uh, and I'm sorry if anybody was a One Direction fan and this is triggering for you, but um, Zane left One Direction. And he left just after Lidl had rolled out One Direction Easter eggs onto those funny middle shelves they have in all the supermarkets alongside the jobpers, the riding crops and the welding machines. And this information came in through their social media manager. We've just put this big range out. Something happened. The bands changed. And the, the social media manager picks this information up, so it dries his tears, turns to the merchandising manager and says, look, we've got a problem. You know, 
one fifth of the band's gone. And the merchandising manager says, well, do you know what? We can deal with that. One fifth of the band's gone. We'll knock one fifth of the price off. And so the social media manager goes, great, I can work with that. And gets this beautifully crafted tweet out, which catches the hearts of weeping One Direction fans around the country. And what's miraculous about that story is that the whole process was conducted by two people in their early 20s. And the whole thing, that massive commercial decision to make a huge price drop on a primary product took less than 20 minutes because all the power was at the edge of the organization. And they, out, they can outpace all the other supermarkets, and I know this from talking to some of the others, because of that distributed power. The third thing I talk to people about doing is actually reshaping the organization. And as part of this attempt by all of us to optimize our businesses, we've sort of contracted in, we've, we've contracted into these sort of monolithic organizations where everything's tightly integrated, and we're all sort of closely working together to try and uh, keep things slick and lean. And that's great when your business is going to be successful tomorrow as it was yesterday, but it's less effective if you've got to change rapidly. There's no slack in the system. There's no opportunity to transform. And because you're also tightly integrated, any transformation requires breaking it all apart and reassembling it again. And the really, really future ready companies, the ones who got this early, have changed the structure of their organization. And if I continue my Lego analogy, the best one I can, I can give you is this. And this is a, a slide I built for Audi. Imagine you give a kid a toy at Christmas on their birthday and you give them a toy car. Now, on one hand, you give them the die cast Audi Quattro, fire up the Quattro. You give them the Audi Quattro and it's perfect, right? It looks just like the real thing. It looks just like the, the rally winning car and it's immaculate. It's perfectly optimized. And if you're lucky, the kid's going to love it for a month and play with it for a month. But we all know it's more likely going to be a week or maybe even a day. If you're really unlucky, maybe even an hour. And the problem at the end of that period is that car can't be anything else. Unless you're willing to get out the angle grinder and the super glue, that car is going to stay that perfectly optimized Audi Quattro. Now, the alternative is you give them a Lego Audi Quattro. And let's be honest, it doesn't look a lot like the real thing. It's got knobbly, bobbly bits all over it. It's not optimal. But the advantage of the Lego one is, is when the kid gets bored, when the customer gets bored, you can rip that thing to pieces and reassemble it into a dragon or a dinosaur or a unicorn or a robot or whatever you want it to be. It's less optimized, but it's much more adaptable. And that's really the lesson is we've got to build our businesses in a sort of networked fashion. And the people who got their heads around this earliest were Amazon. 15, 16 years ago, the chief exec of Amazon sends out the memo to everybody in the business and says, stop talking to each other. I don't want to be another Walmart. I don't want to be another one of these deeply integrated companies. I want you to wrap every little function in our business in a layer of software, like the knobbly bobbly bits on Lego, so that me as the, as, the, as the kid with the toy can reassemble these blocks into different fashions to suit new markets and new opportunities. And even better, my friends can come around and they can play with my Lego as well, and they can use these blocks in their businesses. And that was the genesis of Amazon Web Services, the largest cloud hosting company in the world, formerly an IT function of Amazon. Now, given the opportunity to be entrepreneurial, built in such a way that other people could plug its Lego brick into their own business, becomes this enormous company. Now, Amazon gets beaten up for not being profitable enough. For years and years, they reinvested money and they've accepted the overhead of being more agile than optimal, much to the disappointment of, of shareholders quite frequently. But over time, it's been demonstrated to be the right model. You maybe question other aspects of their business practices, but they've got this resilience down, they've got this flexibility down, they've built this Lego brick business model. It's a hard one to get your head around, but I think it's a really important principle for building a future ready business. So that was my three things, four things really. First of all, that change in philosophy. It's no longer the age of optimization. We've got to be focused as leaders on adaptation. How do we do that? Improve our senses, accelerate our decisions, and build our businesses in these network structures so that we can dynamically uh, change them in the face of massive challenges like we're facing now or much more narrow challenges to our individual industry. And that, Frank, I'm afraid you have to do some more talking now. <laughs> You're still on mute, Frank. You know what? Talk about futurists, mate. I can't even remember. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there's lots of people out there, Tom, who'd be thinking, I wish I could mute him a few times. But uh, <laughs> that's, 
if we were in front of the live audience now, we'd have had a huge round of applause then. That was fascinating and entertaining as ever. Uh, and very useful and practical advice there, Tom. Just a couple of things that uh, I'd like to pick up on. And just let me say at this point to any of our, uh, our viewers, if you wish to, to just type into the screen any questions that you may wish to put to Tom, then I'll, I'll pick them up and, and do so. But a couple of things that occurred to me, though, when you were talking, you quite rightly recognise that at this moment in time, lots of us uh, are sat at home, and are actually reflecting on our businesses and because of the changes that are naturally happening at the moment we we are thinking what will the world look like in six months how can we evolve how can we adapt as a business very interesting point that you made there tom you should do that every six months almost automatically and it takes about one percent of your time now, when I talk to entrepreneurs and business owners and business leaders, the thing they always say to me when I say to them, you need to be thinking about this, this and this, is I haven't got time. So two points, really. Firstly, do you think that human nature being what it is, a few months down the road, we'll all forget about this period and go back to the million mile an hour that we operated at previously? But secondly, those very top high-end companies that you work with, how have you convinced them to actually do that automated six-monthly review? So in answer to the first question, I think we actually will snap back. You know, my, my biggest fear in some ways that it, when this all, um, this all comes to whatever end it comes to, we go right back to the way we we're doing things before, plus or minus 5%. And the only, the, there'll be very few behavioral changes There'll be lots of structural changes. There'll be new legislation. You know, companies will be doing health and safety differently. There'll probably be some hangovers of fear about public transport and everything else. But I think many we might even go further than we were before. You know, I think if there's, if there's probably going to be a baby boom while we're all stuck at home, there's probably another one when everyone gets out again. Perhaps, perhaps less planned. Um, and yeah, but all the things that go with that in a business sense as well. I think we're going to really we're going to really value face to face meetings and events all the more. In terms of convincing people, um, I'm really lucky because actually I don't often have to. By the time they call me, they're usually thinking a bit differently anyway. Mm. And so they're sort of self-selecting. I'm not having to go in there and convince them because they're already thinking, okay, we probably need to do something a bit different. Who can we get in to help us think a bit differently? But it, I think what, what might happen is that this period accelerates some of that thinking. You know, we, we, people were already starting to move in that direction. I think people are now recognizing the, the possibility of this incredible sort of periods of uncertainty and disruption and realizing that you know, having spent years perfecting their business around what they did, they're really badly equipped to do something else when the time comes. And so I think I'm hoping that we'll see an acceleration. You know, I mentioned some names there. I, you know, I get to have fascinating conversations with the you know, people at BMW and HSBC and Barclays and all these big companies who are really starting to think very differently about how they behave, perform, structure, recruit, skill people in the future. There's a, a, a an, another question that I'll put to you now from Ruth, which sort of touches on that subject, really. Um, so she's asking, uh, do you have any tips for future planning when emotionally you feel as though you're at capacity? Yeah, I think it's I think it's it's really hard. And, and as I say, you know, I, I started this business because I was I was physically, emotionally at capacity in my last business. You know, I, I sort of reached my limit. And so, yeah, but it comes back to one of the points about pushing power to the edge of the organization. You know, I think we have a real problem with a, a deeply um, we have two problems with our sort of business culture, particularly in this country. Um, I think we share a lot of it with the US, perhaps we're not quite as bad as them. And one is as founders and leaders, we tend to take too much on our shoulders. Um, we don't, we're not very um, comfortable, confident about delegating early, delegating often, releasing power and letting go. We feel like the risk's too high. Uh, and and it's, it's, it takes a lot of um, you know, confidence in the people around you, but also confidence in yourself and sort of you know, confidence in the business to be able to start to let some of that go. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. And it only really starts. I found the only way you can start is just by doing it. The only thing you have to actually just let go a little bit first to create the space to go and do the things you need to do to, get, to let go more. 
so the, the first thing is absolutely taking a risk you know it's taking it's taking a bit yeah, a managed risk on releasing something um the, the other problem we have is that we have a really um weird work ethic and sort of culture of work in this country that's around sort of effort and we don't feel like we're working hard unless we're putting the effort in and the hours and we're sat at our desks tearing our hair out stressing ourselves out you know i've been working for myself for 10 years now uh that's not true 15 years and it took me 10 years to go i don't need to be at my desk six in the morning till six at night mm. because i'm not productive yeah. and i, I should the, you know I, I, what i realized was i'm really productive in the morning and I'm, things like this in the afternoon, which get the adrenaline going, are great. I can't write in the afternoon. I can't do anything useful if it's just me in the afternoon. So about four or five years ago, I went, why are you trying to work at two till four when you get absolutely nothing done? You know what? Get up early, work in the morning, have some lunch, stop for a bit. And you know, don't beat yourself up. If you want to go and play on your Nintendo, you want to go and play some table tennis in the back garden, you want to go and do something, go and do it. And it, like I say, 10 years of self-employment, 10 years of, of entirely being my own boss and in control of these things. But just to, just to turn that Protestant work ethic off in my head that kept me at the desk banging my head against a brick wall. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's really difficult cultural shift. And it's not just one we need to make individually. It's one we need to make nationally. And we need to start. And, and part of it comes down to how we measure success. You know, are, you putting, are you measuring yourself based on the effort you're putting in and your, the, the, your stress and your tiredness and your exhaustion from work? Or are you measuring it on purely on outputs, on what you're delivering? And as soon as you start to actually measure yourself on the outcomes that you're actually delivering and stop measuring yourself on, like, oh, I must put more effort in, must put more effort in, you find you're suddenly a lot more creative and a lot more free to do some of these things. I, I think that's, that's great advice, Tom, and it's something that uh, certainly I've been trying to get better at in more recent times. But... You mentioned the word a couple of times there, culture. And I think that's absolutely the issue and the challenge here because we do as a country, I think, have that idea that, you know, the harder you work, the more effort you put in, the better things will be. There is a phrase, isn't there? I can't remember who said this, but it was, you know, the, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah. It's that sort of thing. And then the other thing to to business leaders out there and business owners out there and something that I tried to instill in, in our team is that, that I'm not a massive believer in presenteeism. So for me, if I can give you a list of five things that I want you to do that week, I don't particularly care if at four o'clock every night or a little bit early, you want to go and do something else. As long as by the end of the week, those things have been achieved. There's some way to go, I feel, Tom, in this country to get us to that stage and to some of the things that you are rightly saying will make us more productive in the future. Yeah, this is one of the things I think has been brought into sharp relief by, by, the, by the COVID-19 crisis. You've got all these people suddenly working from home, right? And do you know what? The technology is easy. The technology, I mean, my kid's dance teacher, you know, who's not particularly a technophile, went from delivering classes in a scout hut delivering classes via zoom in the space of a saturday morning right the technology is not hard what's really hard is the culture and you know if you're used to managing people because you can see them you can see them putting in the effort you can see what they're doing to try and then you know be confident that what about what's happening when they're at home is really hard but if your management practices already change if your culture's already changed and your culture is these i've packaged up all the things i expect this person to do you know a good performance is them doing all of those things in the time allotted a great performance is them maybe coming back to me and saying actually i think you know we could do this one differently or do you know what i've done this one and actually i went a little bit further and did this one you know if if, if your performance management is based on results is based on outcomes then actually working from home is much easier and flexible work is much easier because you're not having to always jump on those slack calls to make sure someone's doing what you know what's going on you're not constantly monitoring people and doing you know face-to-face -face video chats for eight hours a day to make sure your team's on it because you know what they're doing you've got the systems and processes in place and you've got the culture that they're responsible for it and and you're part of the reason i think so much is going to snap back when the lockdown ends is because although we can do the technology and loads of people have experienced remote working and lots of people might find that they like it, we don't have the cultures in place that mean that the management practices are there to give people confidence that people are actually working at, 
and delivering at home you know what we're still trying to measure people based on how many hours they spend in the office and that's what's got to change and i think that can only change when we're actually back in the offices people get together and go right when this happens again we've got to have a different culture in place absolutely couldn't agree more thanks for that so just a bit of feedback from ruth uh, thanks for that. It's almost like you need to give yourself permission to work that way. And, and it's exactly that. You, you bang on, Ruth. It's exactly that. Brilliant. Uh, another question here. This is from uh, Alan Cross at the uh, European Space Agency. Um, so many solutions are embedded across different industries, says Alan, or are perceived as being in the realms experts stroke specialists. How can businesses navigate the vast array of specializations and possibilities in order to get an appropriate path towards finding a solution? Now, that's a challenge. I mean, you know, one, of the things, one of the things I've learned in the last eight years, and as I say, I work with a ridiculous variety of companies. Um, my favorite week was the week I went from working on super yachts to supermarkets. Um, it was quite a you know, shift in pace. <laughs> from a sort of you know, room in Austria full of billionaires um, to a uh, to a warehouse in Leeds, um, talking to a logistics manager, and but you find there's a lot in common as well. I mean, you find there's an awful lot in common, and, and increasing actually there's an awful lot in common in terms of the type of people who are succeeding in those environments as well. So you've got you know historically we might have thought that knowledge was the big differentiator and knowledge was what drove success and experience in an industry, whereas increasing knowledge is actually quite accessible I, it's on google i can shout across my voice assistant or it's her name and you know and you know she'll give me an answer and you know it's a bit more complicated than that obviously but, but knowledge is much more accessible what really differentiates is skills and and what i'm trying to do now and i'm talking to various educators at the moment is like get together this package of skills that we can teach people that are, that are truly transferable and allow you to navigate particularly complex industries and various industries and the first one of those is actually the, the ability, like learning to learn. I call, I call it the three C's, the ability to curate, create, and communicate. But the first one, you know, we, we, we're in this very rapid changing environment, it's a very diverse environment, where Alan says, you know, you get all this sort of, you know, narrow specialisms across lots of different niches. The ability to jump into a niche, understand rapidly what's needed, learn what you don't know, like recognize the gaps in your own knowledge, learn and fill those gaps and then start to contribute quickly is really, really valuable. And yeah, that brings you to the second skill, which is the ability to create. You know, to once you've seen those gaps, start to synthesize something new, to iterate and test and build a solution. And then the ability to communicate. And particularly, again, if you're going to lots of different niches where you've got this variety of experts with, a, with individual um, you know, specialisms and their own jargon and everything, the ability to communicate with those diverse ranges of people um, use the appropriate technology, as Alan just said, you know, and, and, and adapt to that very quickly. Again, it's incredibly valuable. But we don't teach those skills at school. We don't teach those skills really at university. And actually, I don't think we're very good at, at teaching when people get into the world of work either. Um, you know, I, I was really lucky when I started work that um, some of the first training we got was, from a, from, was, was in journalism. And they taught us to overcome all the uh, failures in our teaching of grammar we'd had at school. And so that, that sort of critical communications training about how to write clearly, concisely, you know, is hugely valuable. And I think we ought to have a lot more of that in the workplace. We shouldn't just be leaving it to the educators to fill those gaps. Uh, yeah, again, just the um, feedback from the, the, the speaker's comment. Couldn't agree more. Being interested in the wider world of technology and innovation is invaluable. Uh, and some of us are here to help navigate. So. <laughs> Yeah, they do. Uh, they do a great job there at the space agency. And if, uh, if uh, I think actually, it'd be well worth Alan and yourself having a chat. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, no, no question. Well, as you can see from this book, I've always been I've been obsessed with space forever. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you, knowing Alan very well, so has he. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, it'd be worth you getting together. Um, th the other point that you made during your presentation, Tom, was this issue of of globalization. And the fact that we tend to compete uh, on that global stage now rather than at a local level. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are, though, in, in terms of the impact the pandemic may have uh, on that uh, side of things. You know, we are starting to see more nationalism and more protectionism emerge uh, across uh, the world. You know, you, you mentioned the United States before. 
I, the best comedy program at the moment <laughs> I can see is is well, yeah. uh, is it a comedy or is it a tragedy? I'm not quite sure which. I, well, it's you, you you have to laugh or you cry, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. I, I, I was wondering whether to buy half a dozen bottles of Domestos earlier to take them up to uh, the Zachary Hospital. Decided against it, but uh, serious note: Do you see? A, a downturn in terms of the trade that we're doing across the world or again do you think we will default to what is commercially sensible yeah i, I think the long-term trend remains clear there's clearly a bit of a correction in that trend going on you know the trade wars between us and china us building a you know a wall around fortress britain which you know doesn't do any of us any favors really um but you know the long-term trend thing remains clear which is the world's collapsing the world's shrinking and yeah, you know, I think what's what's been really interesting in this period where, you know, and it's been pre-pandemic as well, the, the physical and digital worlds were coming closer and closer together. Uh, and you know, your online identity was starting to become your offline identity, you know, your ability to trade online and offline were deeply interconnected. And what's happened, you know, first of all, with Trump and Brexit is that put that stop to that. It's it's driven a wedge between the digital world and the physical world. And, and what it's really done is and then the pandemic has put a total break on that progress. And actually put a break on on sort of uh, sort of progress and integration in the physical world, but the digital world, if anything, has accelerated. You know, all of a sudden, the the, the premium that the value of our digital communications has gone through the roof because it's our only alternative. And so, you know, I think that the world continues to condense in the digital domain. Yeah, I keep seeing my Twitter feed is full of adverts for Korean K-pop at the moment. I don't know why, but they're advertising Korean pop to me. You know, and it's uh, and and that's you know increasingly you know, Korean pop bands are a big part of youth culture. Yeah, you know, that would not have been true just ten years ago. You know, um, you know we're starting to get you know you look on Netflix and you know, half the original um, pieces you see have been produced in China or Turkey or Brazil. You know, for massive other markets that we never really used to have. We may have had business connections with, but we didn't have many cultural connections with outside of sort of food maybe. So you know, the, the digital world has continued to collapse and condense and we're much more closely connected on that front. But you know, it's all stalled on the physical front. Eventually though, the two come back together and the walls fall. You know, we're, we're a relatively small planet, all things considered, by, by Alan's probably standards, by you know, universe standards. And, and trying to build walls between us just seems daft. Great answer again. This is uh, a question from Kelly who says, um, Tom clearly works with some large organizations. Um, does he feel it's easier, uh, the bigger the business, to apply some of the lessons he's teaching? Or are there opportunities for SMEs? So, I mean, I work with both sides of the business. What tends to happen is I work one-to-one -one with the really big organizations and then tend to work with um, industry bodies and groups like Downtown and others to work with the smaller organizations and groups. And, and what I found is, both groups have have challenges, huge challenges. You're trying to turn around the behavior and practices and culture of a business, you know, 40, 50, 100,000 people in it is clearly an enormous, long, slow challenge. You know, if you've got a small business, you can change culture much more quickly, potentially. You've got fewer minds to shift. But you're probably cl more closely connected to the leader. You know, their personality can sway things much more quickly. But the flip side to that is you've got much less time and resource to do that transformation. You can't just throw big money at it. You can't make big investments. You've got fewer partnerships you can draw on. And so it's really, they've both got their own challenges, but they're very, very different challenges. If you are an SME, for me, that the biggest, most important thing you can do if you're a leader or in a management position in that SME is about carving out that time. Now, nothing happens until you carve out that time and I think, as Ruth said, the permission to give yourself the chance to work differently. And you've got it. You, the only way you do that is by, you know, over investing for a while in the people around you until they can start to take on some of that responsibility. And then you can free up some time. And you know, partly it's about investing in people. Actually, I have to say there is a really big argument for investing in some technology solutions as well. You know, we, we in this country. And it's kind of true globally, actually. Like most companies still don't get the value out of Microsoft Office, right? And you know, we've had Office, the Office suite for 20 odd years. We still don't use it very well to take pain out of our day-to-day -day business. You know, finance is a great example. You know, most companies still do their annual budget on some hideous tangle of spreadsheets that was built by someone who left the business 15 years ago. And they're still copying and pasting it into a new one every year. 
you know, there's lots of things you can do to start to streamline that process to give yourself some space to think differently, to think about the future. But it re usually requires, you know, a six week, eight week concerted period if you're an SME of over investing in other people or spending a bit of money on systems to carve that space out. Then you can start to step back. I, I think this sort of follows on from some of those comments that you've made there, Tom. But uh, Joanne's asking um, the, the delegation of responsibility and leadership sounds all well and good. Um, but what if you don't genuinely trust those around you to pass that leadership and delegation to? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I think, it, as I say, you've you've talked about investing in the staff and that sort of thing. But but you can see, particularly if you're a relatively new startup business, that that may be an issue. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? But. Uh, let me give something to, to sort of settle the nerves a little bit. One of the scariest things I find when I go into a business and do some consultancy is that it's full of good people. Because uh, good people will overwork, they'll juggle things, and they'll make up for bad systems. So if you go into an organization, you find that everyone's super bright and working really, really hard. You know that the systems in the business are probably completely broken. And what you really want is to be able to delegate to somebody that you don't respect that much, who actually you don't think is that good, and have the structures around them to ensure that either they can still do it right in an ideal world, or if they do it wrong, they do it wrong with minimal impact, and maybe you can start to manage that person out of the business. And you know, the, the investment is quite often not in, you know, if you haven't got people you can just trust to do it, the investment is in building the uh, training sometimes, processes rules um you know building the stuff around them to ensure that they can do that job in a trustworthy fashion and so you know i, I experimented with this um in a fully live fashion in this business it went, it went about uh, five six years ago i thought this business was going to be a little bit like an agency and i recruited a bunch of young people including some apprentices and um within six months i'd handed over full access to all my social media to a 17 year old um, but because we'd taken the time, A, working with him and training him, but B, putting in place the structures and the boundaries that made it absolutely clear what he could and what he couldn't do, where he could draw information and post from, where he couldn't. And so it, it didn't take as much time out of my day as maybe I would have liked. He couldn't do responses, replies, you know, he couldn't do lots of stuff. But in terms of maintaining a good social media presence and, you know, um, sort of copying my thinking in terms of the sort of stuff we wanted to share he could do that and, and so you know even at really junior level he went on to do an awful lot more for me but at that really junior level at that really young age where I'd, you know i barely knew the guy i had very limited trust we could put in place tight enough boundaries put a box around him that says as long as you're operating inside that box i can trust you to do what you're doing if you go outside that box you and me are going to have words but inside that box i can relax about what you're doing Okay, great advice again. I just asked Tom because obviously you have worked with some huge companies, some very successful businesses. A um, couple of examples of where you've seen innovation, change management applied, uh, and really help that business progress. Yes, you, know, you have to be have to be careful which ones you can actually talk about. I mean, there's. One of the really interesting ones, one of the ones that set me on a path in terms of this approach of stratification was actually working with a local authority. Uh, and he was a very forward thinking chief executive who rang me up and said, look, you know, we're going through austerity. Uh, we're probably going to lose half our budget, half our staff. We've got one of the big four consultants in, like wielding the knife, you know, slicing here and there to get us down to a point where we can operate. But I know what we're going to end up with is basically a smaller version of what we had before. And what we really need is a council that's fit for the 21st century. So here's a blank sheet of paper, design me a council that's fit for the 21st century. And we did some really interesting things in there, like um, looking at the way that they did communication with their service users and audiences, and the way that sort of expertise was managed, the sort of stuff that Alan was talking about, where you've got you know, lots of tiny little domains of expertise. And as sort of bringing those skills together into neat little Lego bricks, we created a little virtual internal marketing agency to handle all that communication. You know, um, starting to bring all the data together into a way that could actually inform them 
um, start to set flags around different behaviours so they can make earlier interventions and save money with acute interventions down the line. So that was a really, really interesting process. And actually, it's interesting because I went straight from that consultancy project onto a sort of uh, multi-billion in global logistics firm. And they had a very sim they had a really interesting problem, which was that they, they were one of these great examples of optimization. They'd had record years, year on year, eight years in a row, just doing what they did, doing it better, everyone charging harder, until their biggest customer left them and took a sort of 30% you know, sized hole out of the revenue for the year, and they didn't understand why. And as soon as we started digging into the business, we realized actually they understood their own business really poorly. They actually had very little understanding of how they added value, what the customers valued about them, where they really made their money, what their products and services actually cost them. And so we implemented this sort of this regular sort of foresight process. We implemented some of these sort of Lego brick style approaches, starting to um, create a lot of transparency in the organization so the leaders could really see how different bits of the organization were operating. We pushed some power down inside the organization and, that, and really cleared the pathways of information flow as well. They were doing a lot of really simple stuff like data re-entry. You know, we, we, they had one example where their warehouse was full of 10,000 units of something because there'd been two consecutive data entry failures. Um, one person thought that there was 10 units in a box and there was actually 100. Another person thought they'd ordered 10 and actually ordered 100. And, you know, all of a sudden your warehouse is half full of something that it's going to take you 10 years to sell. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, and then since then, it's been like, you know, things I can talk about, good ones with HSBC. And I did some work with HSBC last year around, and because the banking industry is changing so rapidly, what we looked at was what are the future skills going to be and the future jobs going to be in the banking industry. So we could go out and talk to the market, but actually we could go out and talk to their staff and say, look, you know, here's where you are today. These are the skills you require to do your job today. These are what we think the jobs of the future are going to look like. We can start to think about what the pathways are to get you from here to here, because we know, and this is a, you know, this is a, this is a, a running problem. Almost every business is seeking more digital skills of some description, and the people just aren't out there. And even if the, you know, even if the universities ramped up to full capacity, they couldn't produce enough people um, to meet the demand for what we need. And so, you know, organisations like HSBC are going back and going, you know what, we're going to need ten thousand people who look like that in a few years. We're not going to be able to recruit them. We're going to have to train them. And so starting to set the, the scope for how those, you know, what those roles look like and then help them set the plan for how they get there. That's really interesting. Yeah. It'd be nice to think that uh, our education uh, ministers and decision makers were, were having conversations with people like you at the moment, Tom, because they're actually people that, the, you know, the, the, the most frustrating conversations I have at the, the moment and for many years has been around our education and academic system because how many times do you hear that story that you've just told of companies knowing what they're going to need over the next five, 10 years, but no educational institution geared up to provide that skill set. So that's a shift that hopefully is starting to come about. We're getting better. Yeah. I think I, you know, and I, I get to speak to a lot of senior educators and they're absolutely, there's certainly, I, I think most people in the education industry are thinking in that direction. It's just the, uh, the uh, there's very little leadership, should we say, <laughs> possibly in the leadership in the wrong direction over recent years, uh, much more towards sort of rote learning of facts. Um, and it's, you know, and, and again, these are enormous institutions with a lot of regulation around them. It takes time to make that change. But it, I do see it coming, albeit slowly. Yeah. And if we're talking about culture, it's that tick box exercise that, that often held schools and other educational institutions back from actually doing that more innovative work. I, I know sometimes head teachers and teachers get a lot of stick, but I have a lot of sympathy for them because at the end of every year, they've got Ofsted to yeah. answer to. Uh, yeah, and I think you know, that, that, that whole stratification, that Lego brick process that I talked about, you know, that applies as much to local government and national government as it does to industry. You know, I genuinely don't think we can maintain a single set of, tri you, know, you should maintain a basic set of standards nationally, but trying to maintain a rigid, in-depth set of standards, you know, for everything a kid does in school, across the entire country, when we know our needs are different in different places, when we know our kids are different in different places based on their economic background, the opportunities they have, 
you know, trying to maintain that complete universality really doesn't work for me. I think you need to give teachers, the experts, a lot more flexibility in how they respond to the challenges they face locally. Couldn't agree more. Just um, to, to, to start to wrap up, Tom, and it's been a fascinating 50 minutes hour, as it always is uh, when we manage to get you to come along and chat to us. But obviously there are some sectors out there at this moment in time who are adapting quite well and are able to start to see what their future may look like. There are others, uh, and I'm guessing the hospitality sector in particular at the moment, that are panicking about what that future may be. Um, and so you've done crisis management. I know you've worked with companies that have found themselves in positions which have not been necessarily great. Uh, what's your message to those businesses that are tuning in at the moment and thinking, yeah, I'd love to be able to think any sort of positivity about the future, but at the moment I'm really in a dark place. Yeah, and you know what? I, there's, there's, there's very little I can say to sort of brighten things right now. You know, for many organisations, it's a case of battening down the hatches. It's about survival right now and using the opportunity and the time to think about what can be different when things open up again. That if you can't get together with your people, you can't get to your premises, you can't get people in, there's very little practical change you can make right now. But maybe there are things you can do to start to think about what that change might be. And in the hospitality sector particularly, and I've done quite a lot of work there, it is one that's you know, facing particular challenges because the nature of their, you know, their lets, their landlords, the relationships they have, their suppliers, you know, all of those things are geared up for consistent day after day service, year after year, you know, long contracts, very rapid turnover, supply chains built for it. You know, it is very hard to, to give anybody, you know, concrete advice right now that isn't batten down the hatches, try and survive, get to when things open up again. And then is the opportunity to start to look at changing the conversation with the landlord, changing the conversation with the suppliers, diversification. And, you know, it's been really interesting, you know, those, those um, hospitality sector businesses that are lucky enough to be able to diversify a bit and have them quite quickly. You know, I look at like, you know, local bakers like mine who, you know, who run a cafe as well. Clearly the cafe is shut, but they were lucky enough to have already diversified into bakery supplying um, goods to shops. You can now do deliveries. They're equipped with a van that they were doing deliveries to one place. They can now go out and deliver it to homes. You know, likewise, a lot of the local brewers in Manchester have, you know, have, made, have clubbed together, used the one that had the biggest logistics operation, doing, very, you know, doing deliver, home deliveries um, quite quickly. And actually some of our local pubs and bars started doing that as well. You know, they were licensed for off-trade as well. Um, so, right, you know, so, hey, we've got to shut the bar, but at least we can turn into a delivery service. You know, some of those things combined with things you can do around your brand, around ancillary products. Um, you know, can we sell the sauces we make, the, the jams, the chutneys, you know, all of this stuff that starts to diversify that income stream. Um, you know, courses is another one. You know, I think the, the, the restaurants that open their bars during quiet times or open their kitchens in quiet times and invite people in to learn and then get, you know, get people back at the, you know, in the evenings for dinner. You know, all sorts of interesting uses like that we're starting to see around that, that so networked effect applied to how you use the resources that you have at your disposal. Great advice again, Tom. Listen, to wrap it up, just um, I'm sure people will be motivated to read more of your book, um, but also there will be people looking in who've not read the first book yet, and that's well worth a read. I can recommend that. Um, so whilst we're waiting for the print copy of book number two, and whilst you're busy writing book number three, <laughs> um, tell us uh, about both books. When, if you like me, you see you're a bit of a Neanderthal, as much as I love futurism. I do <laughs> like it, as you might be able to see from behind me. I like the whole <laughs> So tell us when the, the new book's out first. So yeah, so the new book is out on Kindle now, and it's out in physical copy in the shops uh, July 30th. Like I say, it's part of the Penguin, Penguin Business Experts series. Um, it's a series of, uh, of sort of quite uh, slim volumes like this one. It's a sister volume from by Anthony Nieto Rodriguez about leading successful projects. There's one on coaching your team by Liz Hall. There's one on creating a gender balanced workplace. And mine will be the fourth in the series. Like I say, in shops, it'll be in all the bookstores, 30th of July, but available online through Kindle now. Uh, and then the other one, the, the first book, as you say, um, High Frequency Change, which was my first book, uh, shortlisted for the Business Book of the Year Awards this year. Uh, very pleased to say. Uh, didn't win, sadly, but, you know, it's good to be shortlisted. Um, and that, 
that's available everywhere as well. Um, available on Waterstones, available on Amazon. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the one that sort of really explains this. If you've got that sense of that acceleration, this, you feel like the world's spinning faster now and you want to understand why and what to do about it, that's the one that starts you on the path. Fantastic. So, sorry, Tom, Ruth's just asking, what was the name of the series again? The the series se of it's Penguin Business Experts. Yeah, and it's, uh, it is a it great series well, of books. And, yeah, and, and Tom's is the best. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, mate, it's great to catch up. Thanks very much for spending uh, an hour with us today. Hopefully, we'll be able to see you at a live event uh, very shortly as well. Um, and just for those who are, are tuning in, um, if you uh, are want to to get to to know a bit more about tom uh if you want to get to know a bit more about his work or indeed um the books that he's written or about to write stay in touch with downtown we'll be carrying uh, all the information via our website